uh, good morning. Welcome to uh, today's Mars Trek presentations. We have, uh, we're going to start it off with um, a presentation by Tom and Tina Sjogren. They have uh, extensive experience um, exploring both poles as well as uh, Mount Everest too, right? Yes, uh, they've just about done it all and they, they have a plan for applying their Arctic experience to exploring Mars. Tom and Tina Sjogren. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Occam's Razor, right? Alpine style is for mountaineering, while the Occam's Razor is for science. In our world, simple expeditions are usually more successful than the complex ones. The best example is the race for the South Pole. Scott chose to go with tractors and horses. Amundsen with a pack of dogs. Amundsen made it, Scott perished. Today we know that Vikings went to Greenland and North America, that the Polynesians explored most of the South Pacific, and that the Egyptians could have gone across the Atlantic to South America. They all did it in ships that were small and light. Even Mount Everest could have had a lighter story. Edmund Hillary had never been to the peak, so the expedition relied heavily on Tenzing Sherpa and a climber named Chipton. Tenzing's first Everest climb was actually in an expedition led by Chipton, who had scouted the mountain for 20 years and finally found the route that would lead to the summit. Now, with the top closer than ever, Shipton was sacked from the leadership of the 1953 attempt for objecting to the military-style siege approach. I leave London absolutely shattered, he would write. Thousands of Sherpa carried excessives to base camp, including a writing desk made of oak. The mountain was conquered, but still today, mountaineers wonder if Shipton and Tenzing, had they got a chance, could have achieved the goal much cheaper than the British assault. Drawing from Occam's razor, the history of human exploration, and more importantly, a situation where we have descended from the moon back to Earth, we believe that an explorer-minded, alpine-style approach is needed to radically bring down costs and permanently put us back in space. As a federal agency, NASA must believes that it must limit risk. It can't allow crazy explorers ready to shoot themselves out of cannons, right? But none of our historic explorers died young or in their devil acts. Predicting a threat and acting to prevent it from arising is our most important rule. Proper preparation is the single largest contribution to explorers' confidence and success. In 1999, a member in our team, Babu Shiri Sherpa, wanted to try and camp on the very top of Mount Everest. Now, this was a time when mountaineers would tap the summit and run back down. Babu decided he would spend 20 hours there without supplementary oxygen. We offered NASA to study the attempt. They declined, stating that our friend's quest was a suicide mission. Our friend was famous for his altitude stamina, and we backed him up with a complex safety system on the mountain. Babu made it with ease, and today we know that man can survive on high altitudes much longer than we thought. Babu's attempt was bold, but not suicidal. 20 years ago, it was considered impossible for an autonomous team to cross the Arctic Ocean ice cap without assistance. All of it. 
until Rune and Tori did it, dragging just a couple of sleds. In the 50s, a Lambon barge crossed the Atlantic Ocean in a rowing boat with no provisions at all. He did it by drinking seawater in small doses and by eating certain fish. He also collected rainwater, which is a sadly forgotten practice these days. Bombard's many critics didn't understand that Allen had studied the human body and extreme survival for a long time, and the success was not a result of chance. Now, most people have never heard of Babu, Rune and Tori, or Alan Bombard. Contrary to popular belief, real explorers don't do it for fame. They don't come from money or breed, and they don't seem to have different genes. Amundsen, Columbus, Lewis, and Clark, none of them were children of famous explorers. Their children did not explore. A medical study of Rune and Tori showed no genetic difference between them and other people. The Norwegian scientists concluded that the two were simply really good at what they were doing. Explorers are mostly driven to new places and new experiences by the same curiosity that drives scientists. <clears throat> As of today, more than 500 scientists, pilots, school teachers, tourists, and more than 10 monkeys have been to space, including a colony of cockroaches on Bigelow's Genesis 1, but never an explorer. In fact, we are rarely even asked for our experience. This is Reed Stone. He's a friend of ours. And he recently finished a 1,000 day ocean voyage in complete isolation in his own Mars experiment. I've already been there. I know what to expect, he wrote to one of the recent Mars startups, once again organized by engineers. What if Amundsen had went? Or Lewis and Clark? They didn't need huge resources. They preferred proven, simple solutions. Most of all, they were self-sufficient, and they knew exactly where they were going. No explorer wishing to reach Mars would abandon, would abandon a rocket that took him to the moon. At least not for one that went much lower and cost 10 times more. Had an explorer been to the moon, we might have had a different situation in space. <clears throat> so uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, Einstein said. Sorry. Most mountaineers recognize that the expedition style is valuable, where alpine style can't be applied. Great results can be achieved by brutal force. But the trade-off is high cost and inertia. So light style is always what should be sought out first. These days, expedition style is mostly used by commercial outfits in the Himalaya. Thanks to the experience gained by NASA, ESA, and the Russians, the world is now ready for alpine style also in space and simultaneously a uh, citizen scientist revolution is brewing. In the last few years, uh, street labs are being set up for chemistry and tech, complete with laser cutters, Arduino classes, and biological 3D printers. Walk-ins are welcome. In San Francisco and the Bay Area, citizen drone builders, data miners, and space hackers meet up in places hosted by Stanford, Google, Pandora, and used any available bar. The, there is usually free beer and pizza, except at Google, where you get organic cafeteria and heated toilet seats. <laughs> Anyone in the world can learn math online from the best teachers, free of charge.
Kepler's laws of planetary motions are explained in funky YouTube videos, three minutes max. Tech shops collaborate with online instructables. Simplified tools for design and prototype are put in manufacturing in the hands of anyone who needs to build something. <clears throat> the inventions are funded by enthusiastic crowds of regular people. We can find informa information about anything and anyone in seconds. And there is more of this coming with sensors connecting us to everything and everybody. Citizen scientists are finding the majority of new planets today. Space suits are designed by polar explorers. Hoteliers develop space stations and game developers construct moon landers. Rocket parts can be custom ordered online, which Jeff Bezos reportedly did with parts of his Blue Origin. No cows are holy, and this movement is global. This young space engineer took on the entire Romanian government. We spoke to him last month because of mutual Romanian climbing friends. We now control microsatellites with our smartphones, and NASA buys gear at Radio Shack. Everything is new. Nothing is old. Everything will change. Now, not all mountaineers, sailors, or polar skiers want to go to Mars. We went public with our plan in 2007. Back then, the idea was still considered pretty crazy. It was probably the first time that explorers announced an expedition to Mars, and our declaration went by largely unnoticed. The dream had always been there, but like most, we didn't know that the technology was true. We found out thanks to an angry man named Zubrin, I think he's around here somewhere, and actually the ICC conference, the ICC conference in 2006 in LA. Our trademark approach to any expedition is that we read a lot. In 2008, we proposed a business plan based on books and ideas about mining the skies. Our name came to us from a single line in Reign of Iron and Ice. The line read, the Egyptians trade the origin of their civilization to Python, which was apparently a comet. That's panspermia, right there. As for our personal bios, I was born in former Czechoslovakia in a family that lived with the consequences of the quest for freedom. My grandfather spent 20 years in prison for his resistance to communism. And when my mother got a chance during the brief Prague Spring in 1968, she fled to Sweden with myself and my brother as a political refugee. I took science in high school and began to travel alone at 15 years of age. Freedom and democracy remain high on my bullet list. Tom. Tom was an ambitious son to a stay-at-home mom and a dental technician dad. He enrolled at the Stockholm School of Economics, became Swedish junior champion in sailing, and competed also in downhill skiing and figure skating. We met at a friend's party, and we never parted. Over the years, we have built businesses together, explored the world together, and finally decided on a new home together. We arrived in New York City in 1999, and became American citizens in September last year. Everything we ever had, we have made together. Everything we ever lost, we lost together. Coming to America, we crossed the Atlantic Ocean on an old sailboat that we named Santa Maria. We followed Columbus Diaries on our voyage and found out that even 500 years later, our experiences were remarkably alike. We have a knack for technology. We built a Wi-Fi network on Mount Everest in 1999, back when having Wi-Fi in an office was actually unusual enough. We did it because we wanted to give the world a true story of climbing and exploration, and to us, that meant life. Here is how we envisioned the future of exploration storytelling back then, it's pretty close to what we have today. 
visions do come true. Two years later, we pioneered use of head-mounted displays and wearable computing at Antarctica. Now, this is Google Glass, 10 years ago. Iridium was bankrupt. Laptops couldn't be dragged on sleds. So we had to invent other ways to send, to send word to the world. Months after that, we transmitted the first trip reports from a skiing expedition to the North Pole. Both expeditions went in unsupported style, which meant we couldn't call for replacement parts and had to be completely self-sufficient. The third pole was the hardest and most valuable. We literally broke ice with our bare hands to get there. And that's the spirit we want to bring to this project. So here's our plan. Stay light. Adopt existing technology, invent, but only what we must, land on Mars, and return to Earth. So, if coming from neither breed or money, how did explorers find the cash? Here is straight from Roald Amundsen in his account, My Life as an Explorer. This despair almost overcame me at times, because in spite of everything, sufficient funds were not forthcoming. Some of the more impatient men from whom I got supplies began pressing me for payment. Finally, on the morning of June 16, 1903, I was confronted with the supreme crisis. The most important of my creditors angrily demanded payment within 24 hours with the threat that he would libel my vessel and cause my arrest for fraud. The ruin of my years of work seems imminent. I grew desperate, and I resolved upon a desperate expedient. I summoned my six carefully chosen companions, explained my predicament, and asked if they would cooperate with me in my strategy. They enthusiastically agreed. Therefore, at midnight on June 16, in the midst of a perfect deluge of rain, we seven conspirators made our way to the wharf where the Jöa was tied, went aboard, cast off the horses, and turned southwards toward the Skagrak and the North Sea. When dawn aroused on our truculent creditor, we were safely out on the open main, seven as light-hearted the pirates as ever flew the black flag, disappearing upon a quest that should take us three years and on which we were destined to succeed in an enterprise that had baffled our pre predecessors for four centuries. The boat was a 70-foot small herring vessel named Göa. It was 30 years old, same age as Amundsen. Roald Amundsen had dropped out from medical school and waited tables to fund his dream to save the Northwest Passage. What has not been accomplished with large vessels and brute force, I will attempt with small vessel and patience, he said. A decade later, Amundsen would repeat the midnight departure, this time to flee new creditors with Fram, the ship that would take him to Antarctica and help him discover the South Pole. What about the North Pole? Then? Checking Frederick Cook's notes from a polar skiing perspective, we believe he made it. Roald Amundsen, whose life Cook had saved on the previous expedition, believed he made it as well. How did Cook find the money? Physician by trade, but of meager means, Cook pitched a wealthy merchant for sponsorship. The man declined, but offered Cook a deal. If he would guide him up to the Arctic on a hunting trip, Cook could then stay and try the North Pole. Following the success of his expedition, Cook suffered massive defamation. He was also sent to jail with 400 other people accused of overselling the value of an oil field. Incidentally, oil was found there later on, exceeding Cook's and his partner's estimates. Amundsen actually went to Texas to visit Cook in prison. The meeting was not appreciated by National Geographic. The magazine sponsored Cook's nemesis, Robert Perry, and promptly canceled all Amundsen's lectures in the US. 
As for Columbus and the Discovery of America, the story continues with personal loans and questionable credits. Oldest son of an Italian merchant, Columbus took to the sea in his early, teen, to the sea in his early teens. After being shipwrecked, he ended up working for his brother in Portugal who owned a book and map store. There, Columbus became fascinated with Marco Polo's voyages, and it came to him that going west should provide a shortcut to Asia. Columbus pitched the idea to the king of Portugal in 1484, but was flatly refused, saying that I would fail to quote Columbus' own words. He will regret not paying for my voyage, Columbus fumed, clearly upset with the king's disbelief. At least he knew the world isn't flat like so many others, Columbus wrote, adding, he just thought the world is much larger than I do. Interestingly, the king was right. The world was much larger than Columbus had thought. What if the explorer had listened to the monarch? In exploration, knowing less can be better than knowing too much. In the end, Columbus got a substantial part of his financing through private loans and investors. He had 30% of the voyage covered before the Spanish queen came on board. The history of exploration is riddled with individuals who had to beg, steal, and borrow to achieve their goals. Most did time. Their governments didn't help. The explorers had to go it by themselves. They had to own their dreams. Meteorites carry precious things. Stuff behaves differently in space. There are unimaginable discoveries to be made. And those who stake this new territory early will probably make even more money than the Queen of Spain. Columbus' voyage brought immense prosperity to Europe. It could have gone to the Chinese, but they blew it. And, on, and not until today, 500 years later, is Asia starting to make up for the lost ground. But the value goes beyond the material. As new immigrants, we, we strongly identify with the early settlers of this country. Yes, we even went west in a wagon. In 1893, the great American historian Frederick Jackson Turner identified the constant movement of the frontier and the adaptation of values by the first pioneers as important in forming the democratic values of the new world as was the Constitution. Flying open new frontiers in space will bring out the values that built this country. Freedom and discovery will rank higher than stability and safety. New territory, coupled with science in the hands of every man, will change everything. There comes a point in every expedition where the explorer finds he can prepare no more. Ready or not, it's time to go. Right now, in plain distance, we are closer to the space station than we are to San Francisco. Going to the moon takes three days. That's the space equivalent of the Canary Islands, not America. Time has come to set sail and head out on the big ocean. Polar skiers never start off an expedition by designing a sled. To determine cost and logistics, the first question is always, what will I need to survive? Food is rocket science to explorers. <clears throat> and they have died like flies in the experiments. They've been sucking on chemicals out of plastics, eating only cheese, eating nothing at all, eating upside down, on and on. Sailors learned to avoid certain fish, not to mention dented food cans. Polar fairies know that uncooked coals will cause diarrhea. Experienced mountaineers will tell you that so-called Sherpa lunch, which is a boiled egg, salt and salami in a Ziploc bag, 
beats any energy bar. Food on long expeditions is not about deprivation, but about adaptation. We made Everest on the same stews of dried meat and potatoes that our Sherpas ate. We made the poles, thanks to Norwegian freeze-dried, sup uh, freeze -dried, supplemented with real butter, bacon, and Parmesan cheese. We learned the hard way that if you don't like it at home, you like it even less under stress. And that there is a reason why the world's best explorers spend so much time on the subject, because the last man standing was usually the last man eating. So will space really be all that different? A few years back, we heard that, astro that the astronauts on ISS stole all the real meals and left only mountains of powdered chocolate pudding, pudding to the incoming crews. We laughed because the very same thing happened to us on a commercial expedition to Everest. It's easy to think that meals are less important in the excitements of a big expedition. We found the exact opposite to be true. Food is the biggest comfort, as well one of the first demoralizers on a difficult challenge. Then there is the transportation. Here, too, we can learn from exploration. How do you store egg in a rocking sailing boat? How do you keep produce fresh without a fridge on a humid ocean? How do you separate food from gas in sleds dragged over sastrugi? How do you thaw in temperatures below zero? And how do you stop yaks from tumbling your crackers to crumbs before even reaching base camp? And finally, the biggest of them all, the load. Unsupported polar expeditions are infamous for the extreme measures to cut weight. Fat packs, 800 calories per 100 grams, while an apple only delivers 50. One polar explorer actually ate only seal fat to save weight on his expedition, but he died of a heart attack after only one month. Most kids today pack food containing about 350 calories per 100 grams. Well, um, beer has a lot of calories. <laughs> actually not sweet, it just has 50, but you'll get an extra apple on Fridays. Well, the Russians on uh, ISS, they bring vodka, and that's like 300 calories per 100 gram. Yeah, but with the vodka, it's going to be 150. Okay, so I thought you were going to say that. So that's What's that? Freeze-dried beer. Maybe I should go with the Dutch guy instead. <laughs> the Dutch mushrooms. <laughs> Mars one, right? Yeah. Okay, guys, so wrapping up our food strategy, we'll keep it pretty simple. The astronauts on Apollo had fresh bread and cheese. The people on ISS eat freeze-dried, but get whole foods and meats brought up. We can't have fresh with us, but we found out that freeze-dried can be delicious. Nothing like the stuff you buy at REI. And there are three, three secrets to it. The chef, to try everything beforehand, and to leave only with the uh, stuff that tastes best. All said and done, we'll use all our tricks to bring food that won't rot or mold, that will survive pressure and acceleration, that won't crumble, and is packed preferably in edible wraps. We count on 4,000 daily calories on the two of us, equaling 1,200 kilos in total for the mission, plus 100 kilo of canned treats. So, uh, judging from the space station, water and oxygen actually beats warp drive in terms of technical challenge. Even though ISS has been inhabited for 15 years now, it's still far from being self-sufficient. Last month only, Progress resupplied the station with 400 kilos of water, 50 kilos of oxygen, and 1,500 kilos of spare parts. Starting with the water, we need roughly two liters per day each. Counting on 1,000 days, we could bring 4,000 liters and, uh, with us and just be done with it. But we want to be light, so we still like to find a more solid way to recycle. Machines for urine recycling are similar to water makers. 
Ask any ocean rower and he'll tell you that the electrical water maker is the first thing that will go bust. They usually end up pumping a simple handheld backup. And when we were on Santa Maria, we carried all our drinking water with us. The space station has already tried out a less complicated forward osmosis bag. Danish aquaporin is another promising option. If worse comes to worse, we could also drink our urine straight up. People trapped in deserts and under debris in, um, in earthquakes can increase their survival from two days up to five drinking their own urine. After five days, there is simply no urine left. You lost too much water sweating. If consumed within 50 minutes, urine is sterile for the producer's own body. And in the national recycling process, the fluid actually gets cleaner by each ingestion. Tests have shown that drinking own urine is safe up to three months, but nobody really knows what's happened after three years. Tolerance will also depend on the quality of the food we eat. All in all, we believe we should be able to recycle about 75% of our water. And that means that we have to bring only about 1,000 liters with us, including an estimated recycling system weight of around 50 kilo. The second backup is the water we take with us to make oxygen. Explorers knows the pros and cons of supplementary oxygen from high altitude climbs and scuba diving. On Everest, most gas comes in a free flow system manufactured by Poisk, but there are experiments with on demand systems as well. Back in the 50s, Everest climbers used closed circuit chemical systems. A climber who revisited that system in 1986, 1986 told us that the oxygen was warm and moist and the reaction exothermic. It even heated his sleeping bag. On ISS, the Russian electron oxygen generator separates water through electrolysis with the oxygen being pumped back into the station and the hydrogen dumped out into space. NASA added an upgraded version using a solid electrolyte, but as late as in 2011, it was reported that the station crew used mostly bottles brought up by Progress. Divers frequently use mixtures of gases and the Apollo crews used pure oxygen. Weighing all the pros and cons at this stage, acclimatization and the mixture containing mostly oxygen at the right pressure seems optimal in space. We'll use activated carbon to control trace contaminants and the carbon dioxide will exhale. The approach allows less time in airlock and lighter space suits. Long-term effects of an oxygen-rich atmosphere on the human body are unknown but seems exact, acceptable at proper pressure. Self-sufficient is crucial for an unsupplied expedition. I was briefly paralyzed during our trip to the North Pole and had to create support for my neck out of my foam mattress. In a similar way, no spare parts will be able to reach us once we go to Mars. Unless something better comes up, we plan to bring a small electrolyte-based separator, lots of filter and 1,000 kilo of water. Our main supply, though, will be 3,000 kilo of bottled oxygen and chemical candles. To meet our target of leaving in 2018, we'll have to work with existing tech. The good news is that with our lightweight Alpine-style approach, we can choose between a whole range of medium lift rockets. There are four functioning cargo vehicles with capacity ranging between 3,000 and 7,000 kilos. Only two systems can carry humans at this point, the Soyuz and the Sentu, but a number of man-rated modules are coming up. Because we can't lift crew or cargo above 20,000 kilo at this point, a direct ascent to Mars is out of the question for us. Although we potentially could do it in a Soyuz or a Dragon, it would be way too cramped. Inflatable structures and assembly in LEO make most sense, especially since they've been around since the 60s. At around 100 cubic meters, 
We want something between Bigelow's existing Genesis and the one and the BA330 that he has in the works, planning. We might have to build a command module ourselves to customize for the hub. The inflatable hub will be our base camp and the first thing that we send to low Earth orbit. We will follow some weeks later, either in the Soyuz or what else is then available. We will spend time in this orbit to test and acclimate with easy abort possibilities. Meanwhile, the external support module will arrive with fuel, life support and other stuff, likely over two to three deliveries. On the last day of April in 2018, we will depart Earth in a home and transfer to Mars. Almost the same size as Apollo, you can see us down there. We will take 260 days to get there. <clears throat> so Tom, how are you going to spend those 260 days? Uh, I probably study to be a space engineer, what about you? <laughs> I will learn to play my guitar. Getting to Mars, we will circuit the planet for two to three months before coming down. Now, there are two ways to do it. Let's see. Yeah, right here. Direct entry or from orbit. Mars Science Lab came in through direct, en uh, direct entry with Curiosity screaming in at six kilometers per second. The load was 3,300 kilos, and that's the most we have ever entered with on Mars, which for us is not a lot. Compared to Earth, Mars entry will be just as hot, but there is less atmosphere to slow us down. Coming in from Mars orbit instead of direct will plod at four kilometers per second, which will actually make our descent, descent exponentially cooler. There are other advantages as well. We'll have time to assemble the heat shields, fix gear, weigh out health issues, hang on for weather, and make final checks of our landing site. Our final EDL strategy is therefore to do an air capture from Mars lower orbit using an inflatable heat shield, a supersonic parachute, and assist propulsion. We plan two descents, the first with ascent fuel and an ascent vehicle. If all goes well, we will follow in a matter of weeks with life support. The technology is new, but it's also straightforward. The inflatables have been tested by NASA three times with good results. The thin red line, who built Genesis for Bigelow, are working on it as well, and so is Twero, which is Robert Brown's company. All the other components of the descent, the parachutes, propulsion assist, and etc., have been done since the Viking era. And then we land on Mars. So how cold will it be? Day temperatures on Mars can reach 15 Celsius. The nights can drop 70 below or more. This puts us actually in a better situation than we had on the Arctic Ocean, at least during daytime. The big question mark is how is the low thermal conductivity, which could make perceived temperature even better. It could be windy. The most we have experienced was a jet stream coming in at up to 60 meters per second on Mount Everest. Zubrin says that Mars has dust storms blowing up to 30 meters per second. Well, Tom sailed the dinghy in 30 meters per second. We had it several times on Antarctica, and we even climbed it on Mount Everest on 8,000 meters of altitude. It's windy, but it's doable. Moreover, Mars' atmosphere is 1% in density of Earth on sea level, which means that 30 minutes, 30 minutes per second winds actually equal to three, minutes, to three minutes per second. So, we've already been there. We plan to explore Mars as much as we possibly can. We'll turn every rock, we'll climb every hill, and descend into every possible crack, because we are explorers, right? 
We don't have to worry about wheels. We'll just use what's already there. And we expect help pimping our right from cartoonist fanatics all over the world. We also uh, expect to bring some kind of skis for where the crust is thin and iffy. We learned that at the Arctic Ocean. Leaving Mars will require a mass ratio of 1 to 12. Unless we manufacture fuel in situ, we'll have to leave super light. We'll do it in our spacesuits inside an unpressurized composite spacecraft. To get an idea of the size, Imagine Soyuz as an SUV compared to us. After 10 months on Mars, it will take us only one hour to reach our space home. On March 1st, in the year of 2020, we will rendezvous with base camp in orbit, and one month later, we will point our stern back to Earth. 260 days after that, we will descend to Earth in the same command module that brought us up. The base camp will stay in orbit, waiting for other expeditions, and maybe even Zubrin skies. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when you go on an expedition, the first days are often the worst. But after a week or two, you enter what we call expedition mod. It's a time where initial fears and thoughts of problems from back home are uh, replaced by a clarity of uh, purpose. And this clarity is lost again within a few weeks after the expedition. Skiing to the North Pole, we want to take that clarity with us into our lives and wrote down our thoughts as soon as we got off the ice. We recognize certain routes for success and compile them in a video. And we'd like to leave you with it as a nature's own message on how to get to Mars. Wasting the meaning of 
losing the right It's nasty as adrenaline Breaking up a dog fight like a deer in the headlights Frozen in real time I'm losing my mind It's time to move on Time to get going What lies ahead I had no way of knowing But under my feet, baby, grass is growing it's time to move on, it's time to get going It's time to move on My feet, baby, grass is growing It's time to move on It's time to get going It's time to move on It's time to get going Thank you for your time, guys.